In episode 11, we are going to be talking about why I use humor when I'm talking to other people and why you should too. And we're going to talk about what's the difference between don't fight with me and be good with me. What does being in charge really look like? This is the Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast. I'm Chrissy Newmeyer-Smith. I'm a certified professional groomer, a certified behavior consultant for canines, and a certified professional dog trainer. And this, my friends and colleagues, is the podcast where grooming and training meet. Why is my podcast silly and fun? You know, these are important issues, and I'm sure sometimes people wonder, does she really work with the hard cases with that silly little happy attitude? Like, really? Because this is serious business. <laughs> right? But here is where people training comes in, that our content, if it's related to humor, is easier for us to absorb for a number of reasons. So I want to first tell you that uh, as owners, um, we all often have to explain to somebody else what we're doing with our dog. So don't think that this is just for the professionals. If you're a dog owner, I want you listening to this too. Um, as a dog owner, there are times where I have to explain to my vet or, or somebody else that, all right, what I'm working on with my dog is this. So if you bring him in the back room and you're drawing blood and he's doing it very, very well, could you please do this? Or if you bring him into the back room and he's having a little bit of trouble, could you please let me know specifically what was going on? Don't worry about me getting upset about it because I'm not going to get upset, but tell me what happened so that I can prepare him better. Um, there are plenty of times where as owners, we have to be thinking about how we're going to educate the world around us so that our training plan can be implemented so that we can continue to do what we need to do. So dog owners, Stick with it. This isn't just for the pros. So now, pros. <laughs> we as learners pay more attention when we're using humor and when we're using stories. And the reason why is because people put themselves into the story in a way that they can relate to it. So some of the past episodes where I talked about, say, the haunted house, when we talked about fear, it's it, it it helps people because we kind of go into ourselves and think about what it feels like to be in some of these situations. Or when I talk about um, the orthodontist office, you know, when we're there getting braces put on and some of it's uncomfortable, but how they made us feel safe. Those are things that we relate to because we're relating to it and because we're hearing a story and because it's kind of silly that information is absorbed by us better than if I just sp spewed out a whole bunch of technology, you know, <laughs> a whole bunch of tech talk. And, you know, the fact is that I listen to the boring stuff and then present it in my own way because I kind of like talking to people and creating stories and having a sense of humor about it. But some of the stuff I listen to is fascinating, but presented in such a boring, boring way. <laughs> so another thing that humor can help with, and part of why I'm silly about it, is because it can help keep us curious about new information. Like my goal is for myself is to continue to be curious, to continue to want to learn about something new. Like, oh, how are they doing it? Oh, how is that group doing it? Huh, what are the e-collar trainers doing? What are the clicker trainers doing? How is this being done in zoos? How is this being done with reptiles? You know, like to be curious. Um, part of what helps me be curious is when people can show me something interesting or explain it in a new way or visually interesting. Um, I often will turn on Netflix and just click through and say, what, what do they have for documentaries and come across something that's totally outside my zone of my scope of knowledge and just enjoy it. So being curious helps us learn. Now, another thing that human humor can do is it can keep us entertained and spark an interest. So if someone with a good sense of humor is telling you all about how, you know, don't worry about competing in agility, just play around with your dogs and here's some of the fun things that I did and the great things that happened and we didn't worry about competing. That's how a lot of people end up doing agility, for instance, you know, like, oh, wait, I don't have to worry about being formally in a, in a competition. I can just, you know, set up some, some jumps in my backyard and have a good time and reap some benefits from it and enjoy it. Cool. Next thing you know, they're out there competing. And <laughs> um, 
but also humor and adding stories and helping people understand what we're doing can also give us as learners some confidence in trying something new, right? Like, oh, you know, someone else is having some really good success with it. And she made it sound like it was something worthwhile. And I can maybe try that too. So for instance, um, when I tried scent work, just a little bit of nose work with my dogs, right? I have border collies. They aren't known for their exceptional scent skills. <laughs> but of course, I mean, all dogs can smell unless they have a physical, you know, nasal problem. Their sense of smell is pretty amazing. So it was fun. I found something that sparked the interest and made me think, hey, I can try this. This might be enjoyable for me. So I also want you to think about the ways that we explain things to our customers, um, whether it be, you know, at the vet's office or at the groomer or at the trainer, but just to kind of use some humor and help them understand, hey, I do it this way. And I want to inspire you to try doing it this way because I've had great success with it and I want success for you. Um, people will feel like you really care. Like there's a warm and fuzzy feeling that comes with that, especially when we're talking about this is for you. This is for you, for your dog, for your continued life together. And we really bond with people through that. So when I'm doing a podcast, I'm picturing a person right? So right now I am talking to you. Now, I don't know what you look like, but I can imagine a bunch of different types of you, <laughs> right? I do have more than one listener, I swear. <laughs> but, um, but to think about like talking to someone directly, heart to heart, right? And to help you feel like this information is important and special for you. Um, so I'm also going to talk about how humor and telling stories can prevent some of that um, feeling you have when you don't want to learn something new or when someone is kind of preaching to you about how it, it makes you bristle. You start thinking, are they saying I'm doing it wrong? And God, I know that feeling where it makes you bristle. You're like, oh, don't tell me I'm doing it wrong. Or don't tell me all trainers who use this method are just blah, 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 and that's wrong, right? <laughs> Anytime somebody says everybody who uses, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so when I hear things like um, everybody who's using, you know, cookies is just wrong, right? It makes me bristle, right? Like then I get a little bit um, us and them. And that's not a good place for learning, right? So if we you're, are using humor and we're using storytelling and we're helping someone walk our path, right? Helping someone go, huh? What happens if I go left? What happens if I go right? You know, <laughs> what happens if I go over the bridge instead of go around the water? You know, um, that if we help them, we're also preventing that feeling of I need to justify the way I've always been doing it because she's implying I'm doing it wrong. Right. I don't I'm not implying that anybody's doing it wrong and I don't want people to feel that way. So that's why I bring a lot of humor and a lot of storytelling to the way that I teach. Because, you know, it also can help with spreading that information even further. So if you learn it as a interesting little story from me, you can spread it to somebody else who might spread it to somebody else. And I have an example of that. I ran into a customer in a CVS pharmacy, like years and years after we had worked together. I would say about seven years after we had worked together. And honestly, he's came over and, oh, hi, Chrissy. And I'm like, oh, I am so sorry. I recognize your face and I'm drawing a blank. Then he told me what his, who his dog was. I'm like, oh, yes, right, from whatever street. You know, like I, I recognized who he was at that point. So what was interesting is that seven years later, he not only remembered the information, but told me that they still laugh about how I acted it out in their living room. And that they they understood the information, they remembered it, they implemented it, they didn't make those mistakes again, but also they shared the silliness and the story with their dog-owning friends over the years. Like somebody else with a similar problem, they're like, oh yeah, we used to do it that way too. And then the trainer acted it out and blah, 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 blah. And, and we were in the living room realizing, oh no, we've been making it worse and just being silly. And so their friends also learned the message too, right? And that's what's really exciting about using some humor 
and helping with the story, like making it real, giving human examples. Even though I know I crossed the line into anthropomorphizing, which is, you know, assigning human motivations and human emotions to a to another creature. But I think that there are enough parallels that if that helps us to gain some insight into what some of these little dogs are doing, or big dogs, right, then we can all learn better. So that's why I keep my podcast silly and fun, because it's better for learning. And it's more interesting for all of us to engage together instead of any of us feeling like somebody's doing it wrong or uh, feeling like they're being singled out or being told off or, you know, like that's just silly. There's no room for that. We're all just on this journey. Um, this, this podcast had actually started off as a book. And I had been writing this book for a long, long time. I'll still probably write the book. But um, what I found was that every single time I thought I had something finished, I had new insights to change, so I'd get through a chapter, and I'd get to another chapter, and then I'd read through an old chapter and go, oh, I don't even do it that way anymore, right? <laughs> like, oh, no, I've learned more since then, because I'm always trying to find out more, and I'm a behavior geek. I don't expect everyone else here to be a behavior geek, so as I learn more, I share it, and if a podcast is the way to share it while it's current, great, but... I found with book writing, oh man, just every couple of months, I was like, oh, I learned something new. Where am I going to put that in? <laughs> so um, using humor and using stories and keeping us all kind of interested in this subject is really my goal. And it's not because the, the issue isn't important. It's because the issue is important. And it's important for us to work together and try to find solutions. If you're enjoying my podcast, please remember to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. What's the difference between don't fight with me and be good with me? What does being in charge mean and what does it look like? Well, one version, the don't fight with me, is don't be a jerk, right? And it's very reactive. And I'm not saying that you should let a dog, you know, walk up your arm with their teeth. But to be in a very reactive point of view isn't the same as teaching a dog to be good good with you, which is being calm and cooperative, which is for more of a lifetime of good grooming. So I'm going to break it down a little bit further. Don't fight with me. What does that look like? It means stop what you're doing, right? So the dog who's acting up, doing whatever, now we're trying to tell him, stop what you're doing, right? It doesn't build trust. Really what you're trying to do is say that, you know, I am an authority figure in your life and you must not question me, but not necessarily trust, right? They, it won't translate to anybody else. So you might teach a dog that, okay, she definitely doesn't put up with my shenanigans and I should just stay still. Um, but it doesn't translate to anybody else. The next person, they're going to be like, who are you to touch my foot? You haven't earned that. She earned it by fighting with me. And I, I eventually figured out it wasn't worth fighting with her, right? <laughs> but... It's also a fight for control. If you are in charge, you don't need to fight for control. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more with what we do when we're in charge in my version, right? So, but don't fight with me is very reactive. And what you're doing is in the moment, you are reacting to a dog who doesn't know what to do, right? They don't have an idea of what they should be doing. Um, and they are often just as frustrated as you are. Like, what do you want from me? Leave my foot alone, you know? <laughs> so, um, and I know a lot of the time, you know, I was actually part of a discussion on a grooming list this week where it was, you know, well, you're supposed to hold on to them and really they have to learn that they have to do it. That's part of the training process. But if we're forcing it, it's a fight for control, right? Which if you're fighting for control, you're not really in control. It's something I see my, my owners doing quite a bit that I have to kind of point out to them. If you have to get mad, you're not really in charge. Or if you have to struggle with them, you guys are both struggling. Like he's not the one struggling. You're both struggling. Because if you have to grapple to get a harness on to go for a walk, that's a struggle, right? If you if you slow it on down, slow it on down, and spend time teaching concepts and teaching them what's going on, that really is the no-nonsense version. 
That's the fast track to greater understanding for a dog for their future. So the be good with me in, in, instead of don't fight with me, be good with me is the do this. Telling the dog, do this, do this. This is what I want. This could earn you cookies. This might mean that I back off, but this, this will build trust. Like, okay, I will tell you what I want, what I'm doing and I want, how would I want you to do? And that's going to be easier for others. So the dogs that I work with are often better for their vet, for their owners, um, for another groomer, if they go on to another groomer, because sometimes I'm just there to help with the beginning, expecting them to go off to somebody else. (laughs) Um, But it does also mean that the person who is doing the teaching is in control. I know sometimes it feels like, but if you have to use cookies, are you really in charge? Well, it's not about using cookies, but it's about teaching them, okay, I'm going to build this skill set that I want you to have. Because it's a weird skill set, right? Vet procedures, grooming procedures, that's all kind of weird for a dog. You know, they're like, what are you doing putting something in my ear? Why are you picking up my leg that way, right? But also, those things are kind of sensitive and personal. I want you to think about, um, you want the dog to trust you while you're working on them. And most dogs, most dogs are groomed about every two months, so if you think about from every every two months for 15 years, that's six times a year for 15 years, right? That's, that's a lot of times that we're going to be doing this. Now, I don't want to fight with a dog six times a year for 15 years. Right? That doesn't, that's not fun. That's what, 90 grooms? Right? Like, we're going to fight 90 times? Good God, if only I had spent some time in the beginning teaching you how to be good for it right? That's the fast track. Spending time in the beginning so that the the life of that dog is going to be easier. So spending time in the beginning feels like a waste of time sometimes, right? Like this dog's never going to let you, right? Um, but if you spend the time in the beginning for greater understanding as time goes on, because often those dogs who get kind of old and get a little bit of dementia or start having some, some sore Um, joints later in life, if what's been holding them still on the table is the threat of, of I'm going to fight with you, it starts to fall apart with a dog who is old and frail, right? Whereas those same dogs who've learned to trust me can indicate to me, oh, 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 that that's uncomfortable. I don't want you picking my leg up that way right? Without turning and trying to snarl, without trying to bite, without going to an excess of being kind of freaked out. So sometimes I get these dogs when they're like 12 and they're limping and they're blind and they're deaf. And because they have always been under the threat of don't fight with me, stop what you're doing, knock it off, right? And not because anybody who did it was trying to be mean. That's not what I'm saying at all. Because God knows I used to do it. I'm like, hey, just knock it off. When is he going to learn this? You know? (laughs) But instead, I want you to be thinking about how can I build the skill that I want him to have? Build it. Make it happen. Teach him to be good. Um, Sometimes what I'm using is some of my large animal background. Now, I know in the horse world, there's still a lot of force going on in the horse world, but let me give you an example from the dairy farm because I worked on a dairy farm for a while with the cows and you might think that cows are docile, (laughs) but a cow who's upset can be a real danger, right? But the first time you go to milk a heifer, the very first time she's been milked, that is a very sensitive moment, okay? It's a very personal moment. And she's been out with the herd, you know, um, we in our barn, The it was um, all the cows were in the barn and we were moving the milking machines. We didn't have a milking parlor where the cows walked through. So she's watching her, her the cows beside her being milked and getting used to us, you know, sitting beside her and touching her and stuff. But that first milking, you really need to bond with that animal and like, okay, we're just going to stay calm together. And this is the weird machine. And here it comes, right? And I think sometimes with small animals, because we can physically force them, because we can physically overpower them, we rely on it too much. So like, there's no way for me to really physically overpower a cow, 
Like that really wasn't going to happen. That's not how you get a milking done. <laughs> right? So when we spend the time to be like, okay, calm down. And I'm only going to proceed when you're calm because I want you to trust me, because I want you to let me do this. And what I find is that um, the dogs that I groom, even if the owners aren't really trying to, to do anything at home or, or they're still struggling because, you know, as a groomer, not everybody follows instructions. That's okay. Or they follow the best they can, but they don't want to be a training customer, right? But I can get anything done on those dogs. Anything. Anything. Like, I've, I've been, like, the one who came over and double-checked or, or opened their mouth to take pictures, so that I could like blow those pictures up so their owner could really see what's going on with their teeth, <laughs> right? Um, so when we want our dogs to know that we're in charge, that's true. That's correct. They do need to know that we're in charge because we can't leave safety to the dogs. In their mind, they'd be like, let's jump off the table. And you know, like, they're not going to be safe. They do need to follow our lead. But we don't have to force it. And forcing it creates more fighting. It, it isn't as helpful as we like to think it is. The no-nonsense version, the fast track to getting a dog who's going to be good for the 15 years of their life, is to teach them to build trust and teach them that we're going to do this, and this is what I need from you, and this is what I'm doing right now, and everything is going to be fine. Um, I don't fight with them. And it's not because I have to give anything up. I don't have to be all wishy-washy. Um, I'm still in charge. I'm always in charge, right? That It's my grooming table, and I'm in charge. But I'm choosing to build the behavior I want because 90 groomings is a lot of fighting or three or four groomings to teach, and then the rest are a breeze, right? Imagine that dog is one of your favorites for the rest of its life let it be a breeze. It'll be wonderful, right? So when I want you to be thinking about, do I tend to default with, hey, stop it, knock it off? Or what happens if I say, all right, well, let's calm down together and try again? Give it a try. I want you to be thinking about, um, is that going to work for you? That, and that it's a no-nonsense version, I'm not going to fight with you your whole life. Let's relax together and let this happen. Okay? So everybody have a great week and stay curious. If you'd like to talk to me, you can find me through my grooming and training business, happycrittersdogtraining.com, my email, chrissy at happycritters.net, and through the Creating Great Grooming Dogs Facebook page. And we have these awesome devices in our pockets that allow us to do live video with each other. I can help you with the dog on your table. We can set up live lessons, and you may be surprised at how much we can get accomplished together via video. I'm also happy to come to you if you're near my area in southern New Hampshire.